So we'll we'll go now. Uh, Lucas is going to talk now about the rational use of diuretics in small animal practice. Um, so we are a bit ahead of schedule, but um, that's great because then we'll have more time for the for discussions, and you have more times now when when Luca finishes for questions and things. So yeah, looking forward. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Siva for the kind invitation and uh, great opportunity to be here in Seville once again. Um, and uh, I'm also very flattered to have such a big audience with, with us today. So thank you very much for coming. Right, and I um, forgot a message that I don't know what that means, but that's okay. Right, so I prepared this presentation as a sort of ice-breaking session, so it's relatively basic if you, because you're all, you know, experienced in cardiology, so don't take it as a, a patronizing approach, right? It's just a, a refresher to make the, the day a little bit lighter. And uh, before starting, I need to disclose my conflict of interest. I do have a contract with, uh, with SIVA as a, a consulting agreement, and uh, it doesn't mean that I'm paid to come here and promote their stuff. Actually, I may say something that may not be necessarily in favor of the SIVA products or in favor of anything. Okay, I'm completely unbiased, but obviously I need to disclose this uh, information. And uh, I prepared this lecture, also the next one, with um, some interactive, interactive voting. So if you can uh, scan that barcode, I know you have already experienced that with John in the previous lecture, then uh, you can answer the questions. And uh, the barcode will come out of, with each question. So if you don't manage to scan it now, you can scan it later. And I do have a little test, that's the ice-breaking question, to see whether the system, work, the system works. And uh, <clears throat> the first question is, what is Magericophobia. It's a very strange word that comes from Latin. I didn't know what it was. I just Googled it and I found it. Is it fear of cooking, spiders, fear of darkness, fear of heights? Obviously, you've got your uh, internet or your telephone. You can, <laughs> you can Google yourself and find the answer. But let's try to see what it comes from this, um, from this experiment. Right, so we got... Only eight people that voted so far. I told you, it's a, a nice break-in session, so we need people to become familiar with the system and my voice, and etc. Anyway, 15 people, 14 people is probably a good number. And the majority voted for a fear of cooking, and that's absolutely correct. It comes from uh, Greek, which means uh, um, you know, fear of, uh, of cooking. And uh, it's funny because uh, it is a real pathology reported in the literature. And some people are scared of cooking just a, a, a fried egg. Some people are scared of cooking for big, uh, for big groups, big family reunions. I'm Italian in origin. I grew up with my mom teaching me to cook every Sunday I had to cook with her. So for me, it was like impossible. How can you be scared of cooking? Certainly not scared of eating either. But anyway, well done, well done. So the system works, and so now we can move to the um, rational of diuretics in, uh, in practice. So before moving to the use of diuretics, I'd like to talk about the genesis of uh, congestive heart failure. You know very well how it happens. It's just a refresher, as I said. As I said, try not to be patronizing. And so again, this is another ice-breaking question, right? I will not expect anyone to get this differently, but most common cause of congestive heart failure in dogs, we got 100% of people voting for mitral valve disease. How about if I said, no, that's the wrong answer? <laughs> that would change the entire day. Right, no, you're absolutely right. It is mitral valve disease. So what is mitral valve disease? It's a, a condition where a perfectly functioning mitral valve, this uh, valve that is uh, supposed to seal the communication between the left atrium and the left ventricle in uh, systole, with time, it's a wear and tear phenomenon. Some dogs are predisposed to it, perhaps of a collagen defect, but it's never been completely understood. And um, so 
with time, this valve that works very hard all its life starts failing, becomes a little bit floppy and redundant, and we end up with uh, um, blood that in, during contraction flows back into the left atrium. So what happens? When blood flows back from the left ventricle into the left atrium, <clears throat> we have a condition called volume overload. It means that blood that should be leaving the left ventricle during contraction, during systole, is staying within the heart. So we've got more blood in the heart, volume overload. And the, the heart is a very clever organ. It will adapt to this situation initially by changing size and shape. So the left atrium in particular will become bigger. And uh, as long as it grows in size, nothing really happens in terms of, uh, of clinical signs. And, uh, and actually, the question here, I've already partially answered that, is this uh, left atrial enlargement sufficient to cause pulmonary edema? I would imagine your answer to be unanimous. Well, actually, no. We got a quarter of people or a third saying, yes, a big left atrium can be sufficient to cause um, pulmonary edema. Well, in reality, if the heart keeps um, enlarging, if the left atrium keeps enlarging, then the pressure within the chamber remains pretty much the same. So we got a compensation, which is very important because we don't have, for this reason, the onset of clinical signs at the very beginning. But then, with time, this atrium will reach the point of maximum compliance, and therefore the pressure starts increasing. And when the pressure increases in the left atrium, that's a problem because we don't have valves between the left atrium and the pulmonary vein. So if the pressure increases in the left atrium, pressure will increase also in the pulmonary veins. And this increased hydrostatic pressure is uh, important because for the starting law, if we got increased hydrostatic pressure, then we got a change in the gradient of uh, movement of fluid across the um, capillaries. And uh, due to this phenomenon, we got then a force that pushes water out of the vessels, initially in the interstitial space, and then eventually in the alveolar space. And we end up with uh, pulmonary edema, which is uh, quite dramatic in terms of clinical presentation, but it's even more dramatic when you perform a post-mortem of, of a patient that has died because of acute congestive heart failure. These lungs are very wet, very stiff, and uh, as you can see, full of water. Quite dramatic um, image here. But obviously, if the pressure increases in the venous, uh, venous capillaries, it will increase also in the arterial capillaries. And therefore, we got an increased pressure in the arterial system that will eventually cause an increased pressure in the right ventricle, because the right ventricle communicates directly insistently with the pulmonary artery. So we got increased pressure in the right ventricle, increased pre pressure in the right atrium, and we start seeing the clinical signs of uh, right-sided failure, which is the um, uh, sort of represents the progression of, uh, of mitral valve disease. You can see in this um, video here, we got a, a very clear jugular pulsation, uh, yeah, the, you know, the, the vein running on the neck of this dog. That indicates there is an increased right atrial pressure. Not necessarily congestive heart failure, there are other reasons for increased pressure in the right atrium, but certainly high suspicion of um, something associated with the underlying mitral valve disease. And uh, due to this increased pressure in the right side, we can have also liver congestion and, uh, and ascites. I normally call this the sort of uh, um, end stage of uh, mitral valve disease because we know that pretty much from this stage here, we got four to six months of uh, survival. Then depends on the individual, depends on how often we intervene by draining this abdomen. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I was actually um, watching a movie with my children, got two young boys, and uh, it was Fantasia of Walt Disney. And I thought, wow, that's a perfect example of uh, how to explain congestive heart failure. So we got initially um, Mickey Mouse here, that can be the, the mitral valve disease, that causes this uh, water retention, which is okay at the beginning, probably a symptomatic to start with, probably for a few weeks, and then we lose control. And water keeps building and building and building. And then, uh, obviously, we have the clinical signs. And then the last image here is the diuretic that comes into place to solve the situation. 
So that's how we see the diuretic with a child's mind. <clears throat> right, so when do we use diuretics? We use diuretics to relieve congestion. That's the only reason in cardiology. Obviously, there are other applications with uh, diuretics, but in cardiology, we should just use it as a symptomatic relief. So if there is no congestion, there is no need to use diuretics. And obviously, we can discuss this in detail later. Because there are also different approaches. Some people are not very good cardiologists, so I'm not saying that they are uh, worse or better, but good cardiologists who said that it's better to open the umbrella before it starts raining. So they gave diuretics a little bit earlier, a little bit before. Uh, certainly last night we should have opened the umbrella, but we've been very lucky. <laughs> very lucky, incredibly lucky. Anyway, so, and I said, signs of congestion, pulmonary edema in big letters. Why? Because that's the only way we can uh, relieve um, pulmonary edema, unless you want to do a phlebotomy, as they did in the past before the um, release of furosemide, which is actually a relatively young drug. It's been licensed in 62 uh, and uh, launched in 64. Uh, so uh, certainly, uh, well, all the, as old as me. But if you think that uh, diuresis has been uh, advocated for more than 2,000 years, even by the ancient Roman doctors, certainly a relatively new drug. But when it comes to pleural effusion and ascites, yeah, you can use diuretics okay, to um, reduce the amount of uh, effusion. Perhaps you reduce more the rate with which you, uh, the fluid reaccumulates, but we've got syringes and needles. So if you've got fluid in the chest cavity or fluid in the abdomen, my approach is drain it because it's immediately instantaneous and very efficient. If you try with diuretic, if it's a very mild ascites, very mild pleural effusion, you may obtain a result, but otherwise, just drain it is so easy. So, by the way, let's now think about uh, a diuretic, for rosemite, for example, and um, what would be, in your opinion, considerations that you need to, um, you need to evaluate before using a, a diuretic like furosemide. You can just type as many answers as you want. And um, obviously, I can give you one just to break the ice. Incontinence is uh, certainly a side effect that uh, you need to report very clearly to to the carers, to the, to the owners. And sometimes we fail because we are busy, we give it for granted. But I see approximately one case a year that is referred to investigations of uh, uh, polyuria and polydipsia after starting treatment with furosemide. Well, huh, that's the effect, that's what we want to see, right? So sometimes we forget this very important side effect. But renal function, I totally agree, or kidney disease, kidney, and then uh, we got uh, good renal function. So yeah, everyone is uh, certainly um, uh, focused on the kidney function, which is absolutely correct. Uh, we don't have any other considerations. So what, what I'm, I'm doing here, I'm doing a little um, list of, um, or checklist that I run with my residents or interns when they start working with me, because I'd, I'd like to have uh, everyone on the same wavelength. So that's the exercise we do every time we decide to give a medication. So we need to answer all these questions. Do we have a correct identification of the primary condition? In other words, have I got the right diagnosis? Okay, so if I use, for example, furosemide because I got a cough in dog, that's probably not the right diagnosis. Probably there is something else causing cough there. I would expect tachypnea and dyspnea in a dog with congestive heart failure. So that's an example of a, uh, incorrect identification of the primary order, or is this patient in congestive heart failure? But because we are all cardiologists here, I just removed these first two, and I move to other considerations. For example, what is the rationale of my treatment? Why? Why am I doing it? And what result would I expect? And uh, how can I monitor this response? What side effects would I expect? We have mentioned already a few. And what scientific evidence is there to support my choice. And we do it every time. Every time, so what do you want to do with this patient? I want to start this and this and that. Okay, why? And we go through this checklist. And they do it the first time, they struggle, the second time a little bit better. After a month or two, 
it becomes like second nature. And that's what I like to see from uh, my, uh, my people in training. Right, so talking about the scientific evidence, obviously we need to refer to the evidence-based medicine. And obviously the availability of a study that can tell us whether or not a drug can uh, provide us a clear and, and significant benefit to a patient, obviously that, that's very important, but we don't have a study for everything. I mean, especially after John's talk, I said, we have probably another 10 studies it would be fantastic to run to see uh, to understand more about the efficacy of ACE inhibitors, whether it's uh, 0, 0.125 or, or 0, 0.5 milligrams for once a day, twice a day. Anyway, all these considerations here. So we don't have a study for everything. And um, if we don't have a study, we need to use our best judgment. So best judgment is uh, obviously from a scientific point of view, but also from a clinical point of view, we need to apply those um, concepts to a very specific patient. And in people, that's from a, from a human medicine uh, publication, in people we also need to have the owner's um, um, values and, uh, and the knowledge of the owner's values and, um, and preferences because they may not want uh, this drug, they may want to see the side effects, etc. Which is something that we can't ask a dog or a cat, but we can certainly discuss with, uh, with their parent. Parents, we tend to say parents nowadays, yeah, with their owners, parents, carers, etc. And um, and let's see. So the combination of all these things, the clinical judgment, the scientific evidence available, and the patient's preferences, obviously, are all very important. So it's not just uh, a paper that will provide the scientific evidence. Right. So let's move to um, all the diuretics. We're going to talk about diuretics uh, for uh, nearly an hour. Can you please type uh, a name of a diuretic you're familiar with? I should have put furosemide already, but let's see. Okay, furosemide, terazomide, very good. Then we got, yeah, again, furosemide, terazomide, terazomidas, obviously different spellings. And furosemida. Okay, right, so now we got a thiazide diuretic that popped out there. Very good, hydrochlorothiazide, very good, yeah. So we got three, well, two classes at the moment. We've got loop diuretics that quite rightly. <laughs> what is it? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Who said beer? No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> very good, and that's a, a very accurate answer. Diur beer, wine, all alcohol is diuretic. And uh, do you know why? No? Yeah. Yes? Can I say in Spanish? Try. Well, you, you can, of course you can. <laughs> I, I try to understand, yeah? Um, the inhibits uh, anti the la hormona diuretica. Very good. Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Muy buen. Muy bueno. Um, the alcohol, yes, or beer, alcohol, that, that can inhibit the antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin, and therefore you got, you know, more water to eliminate. And then beer is actually makes more sense because the large volume plus alcohol, very nice diuretic effect. But why do I mention that? Because uh, in heart failure, with the activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, we've got also activation of uh, release of vasopressin or an, uh, antidiuretic hormone in order to retain water. So people with heart failure should not drink alcohol for that reason because then they will have the, we will, they will not have the diuretic effect, will have actually water retention, which is not very good. So no beer, unfortunately, for people in heart failure or a little amount. Anyway, there are actually other classes of diuretics, but we do not necessarily use them. Acetazolamide, for example, is a very interesting one. And from a chronological point of view, was the very first diuretic that was launched in medicine. And then with additional molecular modification from acetazolamide, they moved to the loop diuretics. 
and sorry, the chlorothiazide first, and then the loop diuretics. So that's the chronology of uh, discoveries of these diuretics. Um, acetazolamide, which is uh, obviously um, uh, a carbonic anhydrase um, inhibitor, will uh, certainly promote the elimination of protons and sodium at the level of the proximal tubule in the, in the nephron. Problem is that, yes, it's got diuretic effect for that reason, but then most of the water that would have been lost is then reclaimed lower in the nephron, in the loop of Henle, just before the ascending part is the major reabsorption of water. So yes, you do have an initial uh, diuretic effect, but then at the end, this water is reclaimed by the system. It's used, uh, this diuretic is still used in ophthalmology, and uh, they do have a diuretic effect. I've seen uh, one dog that was uh, treated with uh, acetazolamide was severely dehydrated, uh, but it's not something we would use in, uh, in cardiology. Uh, the same is for mannitol. Mannitol is used to relieve, it's not diuretic, used to relieve um, edema from uh, the central nervous system, from the brain in particular, so brain edema is treated with um, um, mannitol. The problem is that because it's an osmotic type of diuretic, in heart failure would be deleterious because it will only increase the um, water retention in the vessels, which is certainly not something we want to see. So we carry on in this uh, journey along the nephron. We arrive at the ascending loop of hell. That's where we have the action of the loop diuretics. And furosemide was the first, as I said, uh, launched in uh, 64. The oral, uh, the uh, injectable was in 66. And uh, furosemide is still, believe it or not, is still in the list of the World Health uh, Organization, the list of the most important and safest drugs um, for, for uh, uh, you know, treating uh, human patients. So certainly still like a, a milestone in, uh, in medicine. But then uh, in uh, 92, I think it was, uh, yeah, we got the, um, we, or 92, 93, I can't remember, but it, um, that's when torazomide was eventually released from further modification of the um, molecule of uh, furosemide. Why are these diuretics so important? Because they promote diuresis at the level of the ascending loop of L, so after most of the water has been reclaimed. So that's why we got such a powerful diuretic, um, diuretic effect. But when we go to the distal convoluted tubule, that's where the chlorothiazide diuretics uh, work. And uh, again, it's a little bit too late at that point. And uh, we got a minimal diuresis. I don't tend to use the uh, uh, thiazide diuretics anymore because I think it's quite disappointing in terms of effect, unless they're used in patients with renal issues and uh, in combination with furosemide. I don't know. I, I personally not very, very keen on uh, uh, chlorothiazide. And then finally we got um, spironolactone. Spironolactone works in the distal part of uh, the um, convolute tubules, and, um, and also in the collecting duct. Again, too late for, uh, for its effect. is uh, obviously an inhibitor of uh, uh, aldosterone. And so by doing that, it will counteract the effect of aldosterone, which is uh, sodium intake and uh, potassium loss. So this is uh, uh, obviously inverted, this trend. So we got potassium intake with sodium loss. And then water will follow sodium and uh, give the diuretic effect. But as I said, it's too late. We are at the very end when most of the water has been already reabsorbed. Right, so if we start with this game again, right, we're talking about um, diuretics here. What is the rationale of my treatment and what result would I expect? So certainly, we said uh, excretion of sodium and water will follow. So we go reducing circulating volume and therefore, we reduce the, um, the preload and we reduce the end diastolic pressure. We reduce the pulmonary edema. So we basically, we invert or revert the trend of water leaving the vessel. So from the interstitial part of the, um, of the lung circulation, we got water moving back into the vessels. So furosemide is still the major 
diuretic we use in, uh, in acute congestive heart failure. We don't have any other injectable diuretic. Uh, or as far as I'm aware, there is not an injectable torazemide. But um, again, here we have a very a big variation of uh, clinical approaches here. So um, it can be given as a bolus at 2 to 4 milligram per kilo IV, or uh, slightly less if it's just a mild moderate congestion. And uh, we should see a clinical improvement within a couple of hours because the effect starts within minutes when given intravenously or intramuscularly. And therefore, we can see um, diuresis very, very rapidly. But the effect doesn't last as long as uh, oral furosemide. Oral furosemide should last for approximately the biological effect for uh, approximately six hours. That's why it's called Lasix, last six hours. Uh, but injectable, it lasts for approximately two hours. So we need to be patient, give the first bolus, wait to see the effect. If not, after two, three hours, we start again. And um, the other approach is uh, a bolus followed by continuous rate infusion at 0 0.66 milligram per kilo per hour. I was very keen with this approach. I thought it was uh, much better. But in reality, there is not much evidence in favor of continuous rate infusion. There is when uh, you try this in normal dogs, but the effect of uh, diuretics in dogs in congestive heart failure is different from normal dogs because of the activation of the sympathetic system and the renin, and uh, renin uh, angiotensin, angiotensin aldosterone system. So there is a, a counter effect caused by these uh, uh, biological mechanisms. And therefore, uh, we should uh, uh, think about a different type of, uh, of approach when we have a patient in a congestive heart failure. But for chronic congestive heart failure, obviously we can uh, um, um, obviously give the minimal dose that can control the clinical signs. And usually we tend to obtain this uh, at one to two milligram per kilo twice daily. But in my opinion, sometimes it's a little bit too much. We can uh, certainly um, tailor, make this... Um, um, this dosage regimen and make this perfectly uh, suitable for that patient. But again, usually twice a day is uh, the administration. I know a lot of uh, clinicians that give uh, medications three times a day, four times a day, and I try to put my, myself in the shoes of the owner. So, for example, I leave home at 6.30 in the morning to go to work. And uh, you know how it works in a veterinary practice. You know, I'm never home before 8 in the evening. So if I had to peel my cat three times a day, I couldn't do it unless I was going to work with my cat. And, or an, unless I get up at 3 in the morning. So it's, there are situations where three times a day is simply not feasible. So we need to be obviously well aware of that when we give three times a day. Or when we dispense these little tiny tablets, that's what my interns and residents do all the time, they dispense these little tiny tablets, give three quarters of a tablet. How can they possibly do it? They need a microscope and a, and a scalpel blade to get a three quarters of a tablet, give half or one would be even a little bit less or a little bit more. Anyway, these are my um, considerations for a very practical approach. But we do have also torazemide and for uh, treating congestive heart failure. And uh, the um, approach with torazemide is uh, slightly different. We can uh, start at, uh, if it's a severe failure, we can start at a higher dose. And then five days later, we move to a maintenance dose. And this is because uh, from uh, previous studies, we, um, well, they have demonstrated that the effect of uh, torazemide keeps increasing in the first few days. And therefore, we don't want to um, over dehydrate that patient. So we need to be very careful. And uh, I find this table, I don't know if there is a similar one here in Spain. Yeah, that's the one we have in England. Um, and uh, it's a very, very easy table to, to follow. We've got a, I've, unlike John, I've got number dyslexia. I can't work with numbers. I hate numbers. So I need a table in front of me, like an idiot-proof table, and that works for me. And um, yeah, so it's laminated, and it's very useful for deciding 
the uh, right dose of torazomide. Because if we are not familiar with this drug, sometimes it's better to follow these uh, guidelines. How can I monitor the response to a loop diuretic? You can type whatever you want. You can type 10 different answers. Right, we go. A brave person that, okay, respiratory rate, FR, SRR, okay, sleepy respiratory rate, <clears throat> which is important. Somebody here made the uh, sort of uh, clarification that shouldn't be resting respiratory rate, but should be the sleeping respiratory rate. And this is the reason why, because um, a few years ago we ran this um, study, it's a very simple study, where we asked um, clients and their vets whether their patient was um, treated for congestive heart failure in a satisfactory manner. So if the vet was happy with the clinical response, the owner was happy with the clinical response, we call that a stable congestive heart failure, so the right dose. Without x-rays, which would have been impossible, we can't take x-rays every day, but simply by measuring here the resting respiratory rate and the sleeping respiratory rate. And what we found in these patients are clinically stable on furosemide, we or, or torazomide on a, on a diuretic in general, we found that the sleeping respiratory rate tends to be, and that's the, the column of dots on the left side, both in dogs and cats, tends to be lower and tends to be more consistent. And it's true because the resting respiratory rate is affected by a variety of different um, uh, conditions. Obviously, temperature will probably affect both, but noises, smells, vision of... Uh, uh, you know, people moving in the house, that can increase the excitement and increase the respiratory rate. That's why the resting respiratory rate, in the absence of a sleeping respiratory rate, is okay, but if you do have the possibility of measuring sleeping respiratory rate, you get much more consistent values. And how do we do it? Well, we got forms, and usually these forms are used by um, people above the age of 80. They don't have a smartphone, but below the age of 80, even this, you know, the clients are even above 80, they can use smartphones nowadays, they're very, very good. But if, you, if they have a smartphone, it might, makes much more sense to use a, an application. We find the Cardalis application very, very helpful. It's very easy to use. Our clients love it. And uh, so what they do, they log in the sleeping respiratory rate, initially perhaps in the first week, every day, just to get used to the... Um, to the system and to get a sort of baseline value. And then we ask them to do it at least twice a week. And what they do every, at the end of every month, they just click the button, email. We will receive the email. I've got one person in charge every day to look at these charts. We've got like uh, hundreds of uh, uh, clients that send us these reports. And, uh, and we check whether the patient is stable or not. So if we see a very consistent value, we are happy. If we see the sleeping respiratory rate starts going up consistently, progressively, then we call the client and we say, mm, it's probably better to see your dog come in for an x-ray. But if it's all nice and consistent, we just reply to the email saying, all good, and we wait for the next one in a month. Do clients like it? Yes, they do. And uh, at least they know they have to do something important, but you need to explain it, why they have to do it. If you don't explain it, they say, oh, it's an extra hustle. No, you need to explain why it's so important, otherwise you have to say, otherwise we need to take x-rays every week, something like that, you try to put it down this way, and they, they do it. Do they do it well? Probably 95% of the cases. I'm going to show you the two extremes here. This is an engineer, um, mechanical engineer. She's got, obviously, good knowledge in statistics and, um, and uh, logging in uh, uh, values in the spreadsheet. So she created her own spreadsheet, and uh, she decided to do this in this cat, the sleeping respiratory rate, the resting respiratory rate, and the half sleep, half rest, which is probably the cat with one eye open and one closed. I don't know what that was. But the instruction was clear. Call me if you see the sleep respiratory rate going up consistently and um, progressively. And if you see the blue line, it does go up. But the scale shows that it goes up from uh, 14 and a half to 16. 
So it's not a change at all from a biological point of view. And so I called this lady and I said, how about if we change the scale up to 100 rather than uh, 20 and see what happens? And all of a sudden, this line became flat. And she was happy. So we treated with a phone call here. And then we have the other opposite of the spectrum. So you've got a very precise person that is a little bit too much. And then they call you, oh, the breathing rate is 31, what should I do? And they panic. So that's one end of the spectrum. And it's very relaxed people. They don't even know what they're doing here. So you see, the breathing rate keeps going up and down, up and down, up and down. In the middle, the dog is dead. <laughs> and then he resurrects the day after, and it keeps going. And I don't remember exactly, I don't remember exactly where, um, in this, uh, uh, during this morning, she, where she, where, when she called me, and she was panicking because she said that she swallowed the dog's tablet. And I said, how, how is that possible? <laughs> And so she was going to peel the dog, and then she had a, a cup of uh, tea in the other hand, and then uh, the telephone rang, she got a little bit distressed, and uh, she took the, <laughs> the dog tablet with, um, with a sip of tea. And uh, it was a very safe drug, so I said, don't worry. Right, what side effect would I expect using a diuretic, especially a strong diuretic like a loop diuretic. Well, we can have, uh, obviously, a, a number of uh, side effects. <laughs> Hypotension and renal damage, certainly something you have already mentioned in your answers. But very important is the electrolyte depletion. Because yes, loop diuretics are natriuretics, but they also cause elimination of uh, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and chlorine. Therefore, you need to be careful, especially with potassium and magnesium, that can predispose to arrhythmia and also can cause uh, uh, nausea and inappetence. So we don't really want to see hypokalemia. And that's one of the side effects of loop diuretics. Besides, be, diuret, um, diuretics in general can uh, obviously stimulate the release of renin angiotensin, the release of uh, renin, therefore activate the renin angiotensin dorsal system, but not just in terms of reducing the circulating volume and reducing the sodium, but also as a direct effect at the level of the macula densa. And um, so there are three, at least three different mechanisms where uh, loop diuretics can stimulate the RAS system. And then we have another problem, which is diuretic resistance, that naively at the beginning I thought was just something to do with the absorption of the drug due to intestinal edema. But in reality, there are a lot of uh, other mechanisms, including the remodeling of the nephron, hy um, hyperplasia and uh, hypertrophy of the cells in the, in the nephron and the tubular cells. And uh, also, uh, we got the breaking effect. We got several mechanisms that obviously I'm not going to list all here. So it is a real issue, diuretic resistance. And therefore, that's why we should use diuretics judiciously, okay? Because they are commonly used doesn't mean we can give them as a, as a, as a sweet, as a candy. And only in patients with proved congestion. So otherwise, we just have the side effects without any beneficial effect. So what is the scientific evidence to support uh, my choice? Why should I use uh, a loop diuretic? Well, the scientific evidence, if we look at the pyramid of evidence, is not particularly high because there are no available clinical studies for uh, furosemide in terms of comparing the effect of furosemide with placebo. And the reason is that when they introduced furosemide, the efficacy of the drug was pretty obvious. So they thought it was unethical to run a study comparing people with congestive heart failure receiving furosemide and people with congestive heart failure drowning in their own fluid because they are on placebo, so they can't do it. And uh, so that's why there are not um, big studies. This is just a report that was published in the, in the 60s after the release of um, uh, injectable furosemide. But when it comes to torazemide, we have uh, um, interesting studies, and the first one is certainly the test study was run in France in um, uh, a large number of dogs with mitral valve disease and congestive heart failure. It was the first large control study with diuretics in, in veterinary medicine that I'm aware of, 
And um, the, um, uh, the, the study looked at the percentage of dogs that were um, having a, a successful treatment and the time to the composite endpoint, which was cardiac death, um, um, euthanasia, of course, due to cardiac problems and uh, uh, all causes of death. So we have here, um, obviously, a very well-designed study, which ran with two different arms initially, because they wanted to see what was the best dose of torazomide that could be used in these patients. So the first study was run just to see the, um, or to identify the best dose of, uh, of torazomide, and then they compared in the second test this dose with, um, with uh, uh, furosemide. And the results were very similar. So we had both in the study one and the study two, we had uh, a success rate in the majority of, uh, of dogs, 63%. Uh, on torazomide and 55% on furosemide in the first study, moving to 68% uh, or 60%, sorry, I can't remember, uh, on torazomide, 59% on uh, furosemide. But very, very similar results. And you can see in the kaplan mayer uh, graph there that torazomide also seems to be a little bit superior um, in this, um, in this uh, clinical um, um, efficacy. And then Immediately after, the study from uh, SIVA called Carpodium. Carpodium um, proved pretty much the same, that in dogs with uh, pulmonary edema um, due to congestive heart failure in mitral valve disease, there was a, uh, a significant reduction in uh, cardiac-related death for uh, patients who were receiving torazemide, which is uh, branded by SIVA as isomid. And um, this was uh, over a three months period of, uh, of observation. But then they had another study was um, to assess the safety of, um, of uh, furosemide that uh, followed these cases for a longer period of time. And they found that um, isomid was uh, associated with uh, a better compliance and uh, improved quality of life and overall higher satisfaction of uh, vets using it. So this is uh, pretty much my approach to diuretics in practice, and obviously we can do something very, very well. We can do something very, very badly here. And so I've got some uh, examples here. I've got uh, some good vets here that did a, a sterling job. The first case I've got is um, um, a 12-year-old uh, domestic short hair cat that was seen by one of my residents when I was uh, working in the States. And uh, very elegant approach because, uh, first of all, it's not very clear on the left side that this cat is in congestive heart failure. But there are these uh, um, radiographic um, uh, lesions on, uh, on the cold or lung fields that are quite um, focal. And that's a very typical, or typical slash atypical presentation of pulmonary edema in cats. It can present in all different varieties can be uniform, can be uh, multifocal, can be focal. And therefore, if you have the support of an echocardiographic examination, like in this case, then the suspicion of heart failure was pretty high. So this cat was treated with uh, intravenous furosemide. And the reason why I say it's a good approach is because uh, this vet checked if furosemide was working, not just in terms of improvement of clinical science, which in a cat in particular, can be also seen in non-cardiac cases, like in asthma, due to the bronchodilatory properties of uh, furosemide, but also with the radiographic um, uh, investigation. And you can see that 24 hours later, these lungs are now completely clear. And now you can see very clearly the cardiomegaly, this typical valentine-shaped heart. And uh, then this uh, vet measured the blood pressure, checked the electrolytes, and... Um, asked uh, the carriers to measure the respiratory rate, provided a chart, and then checked again these parameters one week later. That's how we should treat a patient with uh, diuretics. Probably slightly easier in general practice, you know, if um, Domingo and Pepper would agree, but slightly easier in general practice because they tend to see again these patients very often. I see this patient once and then they never come back. So if I say come back in a week, oh, no, you're too expensive, you're not coming back. Right? That's a type. They don't say that, but that is what they think. 
And uh, so they tend to go to their vet or they don't go to their vet for this recheck. But that's what we should do. We should monitor the response to treatment. Slightly more challenging case here. This is um, uh, a nine-year-old uh, Norfolk Terrier with coughing and dyspnea, falling, and uh, had uh, a loud murmur, uh, identified the level of the left apex. And uh, on auscultation, the vet reported crackles on, uh, on uh, along, pretty much diffuse along the lung fields. And these are the x-rays. Now, this dog was presented at 2, 3 in the morning. If it happens to me, I would say, just give for and mine. It's got everything that has, is reported in uh, textbooks as a clinical signs of congestive heart failure. A murmur, coughing, crackles. Do I agree with that? Absolutely not. All right? We know that coughing is not a sign of pulmonary edema. may be associated with a cardiac disease, but not associated with pulmonary edema. And also, crackles is something that in veterinary medicine we keep repeating, and we say that crackles are originated by the gurgling, the bubbling of uh, air passing through the fluid in the lungs. That's absolutely impossible. The pressure in the respiratory bronchioles and then the alveolar lumen is approximately one to two centimeters of water. So it's nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Nothing that can move um, water. So can only that pressure gradient can only move air. So if there was fluid there, there wouldn't be any bubbling, any, any gurgling. And uh, this is not my intuition. This actually comes from a, a very clever American cardiologist called uh, Bob Hamlin, and uh, he just turned 90 a few weeks ago. Have you read this? Yeah? It's incredible. It's still super bright and super active. Anyway, and um, this vet um, saw the case. You had a good look at the x-rays. You can see what's going on, so get ready for the question. How would you manage this case? You can write whatever you want. You can run a CT scan, you can do an MRI or a scintigraphy, whatever you want. Try to be there at three in the, imagine to be there at three in the morning. I would be totally dysfunctional. But this vet was extremely good. Oh. All right, that's okay. I don't want to steal time to your coffee break. Let's move to, <laughs> to the answer. <laughs> so this vet if I go back to these um, x-rays, a presentation. So this opacity behind the bifurcation of the trachea. Many people who say that's perihilar edema. That's what they taught us. Well, news for you. We cannot diagnose perihilar edema in a, a dog with congestive heart failure. And the reason is the left atrium is so enlarged that will cover completely the perihilar region. And again, that's something that my mentor taught me, and he had beautiful um, selective angiography to prove it. So the area on behind the bifurcation is all big left atrium there. And then we got this dorsal ventral view with this opacity in the right caudal lung lobe. That's where we tend to see pneumonia in dogs, or at least where it starts. A lobar pneumonia normally affects the right caudal lung lobe, and that opacity is more likely pneumonia than uh, pulmonary edema. And you see, indeed, the left side of the chest is absolutely fine. And pulmonary edema in dogs is not usually on one side only. So that's why this uh, vet treated the dog with antibiotics, didn't give any furosemide, would probably have uh, caused more damage than good. And uh, one week later, took another set of chest x-rays. The dog was doing much better after a week of uh, amoxicillin, carbulanate, and metronidazole. Not very convinced that metronidazole would make a difference in a, there are not many um, anaerobic uh, bacteria in, uh, in the respiratory system. But nevertheless, the dog improved, but was still coughing. Oh dear, he's coughing. So let's give more furosemide. <laughs> That's a typical approach, isn't it? If you notice on the left side, in the lateral view, you can see that the bronchus is completely squashed. It's almost completely collapsed. That's because the dog was affected by bronchomalacia at the same time, had respiratory disease, had a heart disease, probably had also cataract at that age, 
and uh, lumps and uh, arthritis. So these are all signs of heart failure? No. And cough is one of them. Okay, it's a sign of a comorbidity. So they don't still coughing, good, because cough is actually helping patients like this in uh, removing the debris from, uh, from the affected lungs. And um, you can see an improvement with antibiotics. If this was pulmonary edema, then the opacity in that lung lobe will still be there. And it's gone, almost 100%. Still a little bit of residual, so the antibiotic was continued for uh, another week. Excellent approach. Okay, when you don't follow the guidelines like the algorithm of cough, crackles, and murmur, give for rosemary. No, that's wrong use. You've, we've got the most amazing diagnostic tool. It counts for free. <coughs> and it's our brain, right? And if, you don't, if we don't use it, we lose 90% of the pleasure of this job. Okay, so we need to be critical. No, we're working on algorithms. But obviously there are also poor examples, and uh, this one I think was very, very poor management. It was a young four-year-old St. Bernard, when I say was, it says a lot, and um, all that was seen many, many years ago, had an acute onset of hemorrhagic vomiting and diarrhea. And this dog obviously was uh, admitted to an emergency vet who detected a heart murmur during physical examination, and uh, so did an echo, did this echo, these are the echo images from, uh, from the vet, and made a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, if you know John Bonagure, who is one of the best cardiologists in the world, and I think everyone would agree with that, once he said, if you can lift a dog on your own and put it on the table, that's mitral disease. If you need two people, it's DCM. If it's a cat, it's HCM. He was joking, of course, <laughs> but just to emphasize how we tend to oversimplify cardiology in, uh, in practice. So obviously, probably they needed two people to lift this and burn it on the x-ray table, and they made a diagnosis of DCM. Right. The vet started treatment with furosemide, pimobendin, and AC inhibitor. I put pimobendin and AC inhibitor in brackets because probably that wasn't the mistake. The mistake, in my opinion, was the furosemide. Why do you think it was a mistake? You can type whatever you want. You can, you can type in Spanish. I can read Spanish, no worries. Uh, you don't want to criticize a colleague. That's a very good policy. Never criticize a colleague because it's a boomerang that will come back to you. <laughs> But in this case, we, okay, let's say this was my case, so we don't criticize, it was my case. Right, I don't think that this dog had dilated cardiomyopathy. I mean, the, the images are okay. The M-mode scanning of the left ventricle shows uh, a very irregularly irregular heart rhythm and relatively fast, so I would suspect a natural fibrillation there. And, um, but it's not really dilated, okay? It's, um, it's contracting and... Um, and obviously probably increasing um, the speed of, uh, of the sweep of the mod would have helped to understand the dynamic of this ventricle, but never mind. The X-ray underneath, I don't think, is uh, compatible with uh, congestive heart failure. Okay, we do have a big left atrium, which might explain the reason of uh, the atrial fibrillation, but the lung lobes are clear and the, um, there is no real evidence of uh, venous congestion. So there is only cardiomegaly, which alone we saw at the very beginning is not sufficient for a diagnosis of congestive heart failure. But above all, so apart from the most likely wrong diagnosis, um, this dog presented with uh, vomiting and diarrhea, quite severe one. So by default, this dog is dehydrated. So you don't give diuretics, to a dog that is already dehydrated, right, it's just pushing and tilted the balance a little bit too much. The dog had GDV, so had a gastric dilation volvulus, and uh, so he went straight to surgery and uh, unfortunately died during um, induction of anesthesia. It was too late, it was too dehydrated, and so I think why, that's why I think this approach was not correct. Oh, somebody had uh, actually wrote for us, for us media. Yes, absolutely. 
that was not, in my opinion, the right approach. So we've seen good examples, bad examples, and uh, so um, I hope that will, um, this will stimulate some uh, discussion. So thank you very much.